Hello, and welcome to the video introduction of our paper, Epistemic Closure and Folk Epistemology. In this video, we will explain what the epistemic closure principle is, why philosophers care about it, and we will describe some experimental epistemology aimed at investigating the evidence typically offered in support of closure. We will then describe the results of our investigation. We provide evidence that epistemic closure is indeed a feature of folk epistemology. The epistemic closure principle concerns the extent of our knowledge. In particular, it is about what we know given the entailments of other things we know. There are a variety of epistemic closure principles, some more plausible than others. According to EC1, if S knows the P, and S knows the P entails Q, then S knows the Q. EC1 is unsatisfactory because it doesn't allow for the possibility that one can know P and know that P entails Q without inferring and coming to believe Q. EC2 improves upon EC1 in this respect. According to EC2, if S knows the P, and S knows the P entails Q, then S knows, or is in a position to know, the Q. Timothy Williamson defends a closure principle, according to which, if S knows the P, competently deduces Q from P, and thereby comes to believe Q, then S knows the Q. And John Hawthorne's closure principle says that if S knows the P, and competently deduces Q from P, thereby coming to believe Q, while retaining one's knowledge that P, one comes to know the Q. Closure has received a great deal of attention for its role in debates about skepticism. Is there an external world? Most of us want to say that of course there is. But do you know that you're not a brain in a vat, or living in the matrix? Perhaps not. A closure principle can be used as part of a skeptical argument, as seen here. If I know that there is an external world, then I know that I am not a brain in a vat. But I do not know that I am not a brain in a vat. Therefore, I do not know that there is an external world. This first premise is simply an abbreviation of an epistemic closure principle. Partly to avoid skepticism, philosophers Robert Nozick and Fred Dretzky have denied that any epistemic closure principle is true. Most other epistemologists, however, endorse epistemic closure. Hawthorne says that closure is an extremely intuitive idea, and Williamson claims that closure captures the obvious truth that deduction is a way of extending one's knowledge. These defenses of epistemic closure depend on what is intuitive, plausible, or what we tend to think about knowledge. In other words, they rely upon claims about folk epistemology. For this reason, the closure debate has drawn the attention of experimental philosophers ready to investigate what the folk theory of epistemology actually is. Does it include an epistemic closure principle? Experimental philosopher John Turry ran a series of experiments involving stolen cars and crashed computers to investigate. Here is one vignette, called Car Theft. When Mr. Maxwell arrives at work in the morning, he always parks in one of two spots, C8 or D8. Half the time he parks in C8, and half the time he parks in D8. Today, Maxwell parked in C8. It's lunchtime at work. Maxwell and his assistant are up in the archives room, searching for a particular document. Maxwell says, I might have left the document in my car. The assistant asks, Mr. Maxwell, is your car parked in space C8? It's not unheard of for cars to be stolen. The perception version of car theft ends with the following words. Maxwell looks carefully out the window and then responds, No, my car has not been stolen. It is parked in C8. And the inference condition ends with, Maxwell thinks carefully for a moment and then responds, No, my car has not been stolen. It is parked in C8. Turi then asks participants to select all of the statements below that are true in the car theft vignette. Maxwell knows that his car is parked in C8. Maxwell knows that his car has not been stolen. Maxwell is in the archives room and Maxwell is in his assistant's office. Statements 2.3 and 2.4 served as comprehension checks. 2.1 and 2.2 tested for closure because Turi intended Maxwell to be depicted as 1, considering his belief that his car is parked in C8 and the basis upon which his belief rests, 2, reaffirming his belief that his car is indeed parked there, 3, appreciating that his car is not being stolen follows from its being parked in C8, and 4, affirming that it has not been stolen on this basis. If participants endorse closure, they should select 2.2 as often as they select 2.1. But if they reject closure, they should select 2.2 less often. Turi found that participants thought Maxwell both knew that his car was parked in C8 and knew that it had not been stolen in the perception condition. And in the inference condition, participants thought that Maxwell knew that his car was parked in C8, but they were significantly less likely to think he knew it had not been stolen. So, the evidence supports a perceptual epistemic closure principle. In our investigation, we first set out to replicate Turi's initial findings, which we succeeded in doing. 
We also gave participants questions which employed the revised version of the closure principle, EC2. We worried that in the stolen car case, participants took Maxwell to perceive that his car had not been stolen, rather than taking Maxwell to infer, on the basis of closure, that it had not been stolen. So we modified the case by asking whether Maxwell knows where his car is parked, and also whether it had not been destroyed and replaced by an exact replica. Study 4 utilizes a modified version of car theft to test a different knowledge claim. Study 5 compares the responses of mathematicians with the responses of undergrads. Let's discuss 3 and 5. Replica is based on the structure of car theft, but is designed to make it such that Maxwell is incapable of directly perceiving that his car has not been stolen. Mr. Maxwell lives in a world where wizards like to practice their magical skills by destroying ordinary objects and replacing them with exact replicas. When Mr. Maxwell arrives at work in the morning, he parks his car in his usual spot, space C8. At lunchtime, Maxwell and his assistant are up in the archives room, searching for a particular document. Maxwell says, I might have left the document in my car. The assistant asks, Mr. Maxwell, is your car still parked in space C8? It's not unheard of for wizards to destroy ordinary objects and replace them with exact replicas. The perception condition ends with, Maxwell looks carefully out the window and then responds, My car is parked in C8, so it has not been destroyed and replaced with an exact replica. And the inference condition ends with, Maxwell thinks carefully for a moment and then responds, My car is parked in C8, so it has not been destroyed and replaced with an exact replica. We then ask participants to answer questions about what Maxwell knows to test whether they endorse closure. On the whole, participants were not inclined to think that Maxwell knows either that his car is parked in C8 or that it has not been destroyed and replaced with an exact replica. Roughly three-fourths of participants in the perception condition and two-thirds in the inference condition attribute knowledge in ways that were consistent with closure. The difference between these distributions failed to be significant. Our results suggested that, based on the way in which participants attribute knowledge, they overwhelmingly endorse closure in both perception and inference cases. A common response to the surprising results from experimental philosophy is to deny that they are worth much on the grounds that experimental philosophers study a population of non-experts. This is called the expertise response. Without endorsing this as a general response to experimental philosophy, we wondered whether individuals with extensive training in deductive reasoning would attribute knowledge differently than do non-experts, thereby demonstrating different implicit views on the closure principle. This allowed us to test the possibility that participants in earlier experimental work were making a performance error when they attributed knowledge not in accordance with closure. We therefore recruited 208 professional mathematicians employed in research universities in the U.S. for our studies and presented them with a car theft case and a similar case involving crashed computers and compared their responses to the responses of undergraduate students. There were significant differences in how undergraduates and mathematicians responded to the research materials. Mathematicians reported lower levels of agreement with all knowledge claims when compared with the undergraduates. Mathematicians were also much less likely to reject closure in either the perception or inference conditions. This suggests that when non-experts make knowledge attributions that are inconsistent with closure principles, they are making a performance error. This is just a very brief overview of some of our investigation. We maintain that an unrestricted closure principle that applies to all beliefs, regardless of source, provides a better model of the patterns of folk knowledge attributions that have been observed, and thus that closure does seem to be a core part of folk epistemology after all. For a fuller defense of this conclusion, please read our paper. Thanks for listening. Thanks especially to the organizers of the 2016 Minds Online Conference and to our referees.